Welcome to the Garden Endless, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. Hey, Carol. Hey, Dee. It's great to talk to you today. It is. We're doing this in the a.m. instead of the p.m. like normal. Yes, although here it's it's getting towards the p.m., but it's, so it's not like it's 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, that's true. Well, I'm an hour behind. We should tell people that. But, yes. you know, anyway, I, I think you have a quote for us this morning. I do. And I, I have this quote because you've been traveling and I haven't. So I came up with a quote that I thought, well, I'll just show her. You ready? <laughs> yeah. It is unnecessary to go to faraway places to see marvels. The mystery is always at our door. From Marvels at Our Feet by Liberty Hyde Bailey, 1945. That's true, you know. I was thinking this weekend, because I was at the Garden Bloggers Fling in Denver, and poppies and iris were blooming in Denver this time of year, and I was gazing down into a poppy, because they're all different kinds, and I thought, you know, there's an entire world in a poppy blossom. There is. There's an entire... You look in in any flower, and you're going to find a world that you never knew existed. Exactly. But... We really shouldn't be talking about poppies particularly because today's topic are edible flowers. And poppies, you shouldn't eat those. (laughs) No, poppies are bad for you. (laughs) Yes, so we're going to talk about edible flowers, flowers that you can actually eat. Yes, and I love this topic. I really do. I love edible flowers, and I use them all the time. I like the idea of edible flowers, but I never think to actually eat flowers. Well, let's expand your palate today, shall we? We shall expand my palate. I I should say I have had, in teas and things like that, I've had flowers. Exactly. So some edible flowers that I grow are nasturtiums. Check. Which my mom, which my mom always called the nasties. I have no idea why. Um, because they aren't nasty. They're really sweet. And I'm actually trying a new one this year. That's an AAS winner, All-American Selection, and it's called Baby Rose. Are you trying it too? I did not get Baby Rose to try. You did not? Okay, well, it's a little, it's a compact one. You know how nasturtiums often trail? Yes. Baby Rose does not trail. It stays very compact, and it would work really well in a raised bed or in a container, and it has a really beautiful flower, and I'll, I'll put some up on our Instagram. I also grow pot marigolds, which are calendula. I have grown those in the past, mostly from seed sown out in the garden, but not lately. Yeah, and I sow, I sow both of these out directly into the garden. And really quickly, marigolds come from, you know, the marigolds we talk about in the United States are the ones that you're doing the national collection of marigolds at your house. Right. Um, are not the same as calendula. They're called marigold, marigolds because of the coloration, both types. And it stands for Mary's Gold, which has to do with the Blessed Mother. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. And and nobody in their right mind would try to eat a marigold marigold because of the scent. It's off-putting to many people. It is. Um, but very pretty. And I suspect what happened was when the monks came over from Europe where they had calendula, they, and when they were over in Mexico, where marigolds are, I think, from, they said, oh, well, these will be Mary's gold, you know, to teach, to teach. Right. So then there's borage, which I always want to say is barrage because I took a lot of French, but it's borage. And that one has that blue, little blue flower, super fuzzy leaves. You grow it, don't you? I have grown it and uh, I was hoping it would naturalize a bit in my garden and it didn't. And so I need to get some more. It has totally naturalized in my garden. Um, I would say if you live in my climate, if you grow borage, you will always have borage. But it's it tastes like cucumber when you eat it. And um, I think it's really pretty on top of like a cake or something like that. And then there's daylilies, which are edible, and people don't really realize that. But they should because deer love daylilies. And I have plenty of daylilies. Dandelions, as we've talked before, are also edible, the leaves and the actual flower, and quite the delicacy in Europe. And I have plenty of dandelions in the spring, but they are uh, they don't flower much in the summertime around here. You get a few, but not many. No, we get mostly in the spring. And then hibiscus, which I have never grown, but people make tea out of it all the time. And I have some 
there's all kinds of hibiscus. There's a tropical hibiscus, and then there's hardy hibiscus, which uh, is root hardy. Wait, what am I saying? Of course I grow hibiscus. Yeah. I'm losing my mind. I was thinking about pink and how everything flavored by hibiscus is bright pink. And I was thinking that doesn't fit anything in my garden. But of course I grow hibiscus, both tropical and hardy. Okay. Because I just got some trial hardy ones to try and they've got, I've got those growing out in the garden. So I may have some hibiscus to pretend to maybe think about eating. <laughs> <laughs> so who did you get the hibiscus from? Uh, Do you remember? The hibiscus was is it? from... Bailey Nurseries? No, it's not from Bailey. It's from uh, Friends of Roseanne. Huh. Interesting. Um, they're, st- they're doing a lot of interesting things with hibiscus right now, especially the, well, both of them, tropical and perennial. Lavender. I have lavender. And I, um, I should do more with lavender because I had a delicious lavender lemonade drink uh, when I was on vacation, and it was lemonade that was flavored with lavender, and it was delicious. Delicious. I've actually made short. I made shortbread cookies that were lemon lavender one time. They were pretty good. I don't have a recipe for them. I just use someone else's. And you know, you could just do any lemon shortbread cookie and add some lavender blossoms to it. Pansies, of course. I have pansies not right now because it's getting hotter. But pansies right. are great. Uh, slap one of those on top of a cupcake, right? Right, and they look beautiful. They're also really, really beautiful frozen in uh, ice cubes. Yes, they would be. And then you, and then you could put them in your lavender lemonade. That'd be fun. And then roses, yes. of course. We all know roses are edible, unless, of course, you put a lot of stuff on your roses. Then I wouldn't eat them. No. <laughs> Squash blossoms. Yes. Have you ever had those? I have not. I used to have a friend at work who's since passed away who always wanted me to save some squash blossoms for him. But I know people like put uh, like a cream cheese inside of them and then Mm -hmm. fry them and anything fried is good. Yeah, pretty much. Um, They usually do something like a chive cream cheese or something like that because the squash blossoms themselves don't have a lot of taste. But um, I've done them both ways. I've stuffed them and fried them and I've just fried them by themselves in uh, a gram flour, which is a flour you can buy at an Indian food market. And... um, it, they are exquisite, really exquisite. Sunflowers. We know sunflowers are edible. Sunflower seeds. So, but you wouldn't eat a sunflower petal, would you? Well, I think you could if you wanted to. But here's the thing. It takes so long to get the sunflowers because they have to grow, you know, really tall for a lot of varieties. And so I just leave them out there and then I use the heads and give them to the birds. But you, I guess you could if you wanted to, but no. Right, right. And then violets. Violets are edible. Woodland violets. And in Victorian times, they like to sugar them and then put them on cakes. And violets are supposed mm. to be an excellent source of vitamin C. I did not know that. How interesting. I read that somewhere. Peonies are edible. Peonies are edible. Yes, we talked about that a couple of times ago, and I didn't know that peonies were edible, so that's interesting. There's a lot of flowers that are edible, but... We would caution you before eating any flour to make sure it is edible first because you don't want to eat something that exactly. you're not supposed to. Um, what, do you, what would you suggest people do if they want to learn more about edible flours? Well, I would uh, go find a great book like The Edible Flower Garden by Rosalind Creasy. Mm-hmm. It's a good and book. I would read about him. Yeah. I'd read that book. And I can't remember. Does, does that one also have um, recipes in it? Or does it just grow the flowers? I am looking at my bookshelf to see if I can find my copy of it. Well, I would presume that it has recipes. I would think so. But um, it's a good book, a really good book. Right. A lot of the flowers are used in making jams and jellies. And our, our friend, Ellen Zakos, the backyard forager, she's been messaging me on Facebook about saving her peonies. Uh, they're they're just in the tight bud stage, and she wants to have them in about a week, the petals, so she can make a jam out of them. Mm, I think that would be so, delicious. She was asking me about cutting those and putting them in the refrigerator, which kind of keeps them from opening, and then when she comes back, she can take them out, they'll open up, and then she'll have the 
petals that she needs to make her jam, and she promised to give me a jar of it. Oh, that's nice. And wouldn't that be pretty? It's probably a lovely light pink, like milkweed blossoms. I know that she makes uh, she makes both a simple syrup, and she also makes a um, a jam from milkweed blossoms. Don't eat milkweed itself, but the blossoms, I guess, are edible. That's what I'm told, anyway. Right. So with most of these flowers, what we should tell people is most of these are used as a garnish or as a supplemental flavoring for a jam or jelly or, like you said, a simple syrup. Mm-hmm. It's it's not like you're going to pick a bunch of lavender and slap it between two pieces of bread and eat it like a sandwich. No, and we should also... <laughs> it doesn't even sound, sound good. good at all. We should also point out that... Um, many of these are used as garnishes because they have a very strong flavor and that different varieties of them, especially like with lavender, have slightly different taste based on the scent. And so you might like one kind of lavender, but not another kind of lavender. And people often use them as to go with tea or with lemonade or some other flavoring that enhances them. And hibiscus is a perfect example of that because the Hispanic community uh, does a lot of hibiscus waters. You know, because they like aguas frescas. I mean, who doesn't like aguas frescas? Uh-huh. And one of them is hibiscus, and oh. it's really, really, really good. Um, borage, I, I got to say, I'm not a huge fan of the cucumber flavor, but it sure is pretty, and then I just move it aside. I put it in salads and then just move it over. And as for my uh, pansies, I do kind of the same thing. They they don't taste like much, actually. Pansies don't. No. Nasturtiums, I don't want to eat a whole one of those either. But nasturtium blossoms on top of a, a salad are really good, and I just made one and used I used the flowers on top. Yeah, that's that makes it very pretty, a very pretty thing. So a couple of cautions we should give people if you're going to grow edible flowers. First of all, don't use a bunch of pesticides. Um, it is almost impossible to wash off the pesticides off of flour. It's, yeah. it's just they're too delicate. You're never going to get it off. It's not like you can scrub them. So the no. same as with vegetables, don't put pesticides on the flowers if you're going to use them for food. Right, and you want to help your pollinators anyway, so you probably won't be. None of these that we've talked about really need pesticides. I've grown a bunch of them, and they all do just fine. And hibiscus attract bumblebees. Lavender attracts several different um, pollinators. So to not hurt you or the pollinators, don't do pesticides. And then the other thing is be careful eating flowers in large quantities. Not that you're going to do that, but if you've never had these as with anything that's sort of foreign, go slow. Make sure that it's not going to cause you some sort of digestive upset or anything. And make sure you're well-versed on any side effects that there could be um, and have good information before you just, like, bite into a big old daylily bloom. Although it wouldn't hurt you to eat a daylily bloom, probably. No, that's probably not a good example. But, but go slow. And also, even though I believe that all daylilies are um, are edible, there is some talk uh, among the foragers that only certain varieties are. So do some research on that before you eat them. Um, I have never heard of anyone being poisoned by a daylily bloom, but um, that was an issue in in a book that we read one time because she didn't discern that. So look it up just to make sure. I think it's Hemerocallus fulva, but don't quote me on that because I didn't, I didn't research it before I came here, but I just thought of it. Also, grow them right in your vegetable garden. You, you know, flowers attract pollinators, so that'll help your vegetables to be pollinated. Um, they're beautiful in a vegetable garden. A vegetable garden that is lined with gorgeous flowers just enhances it. Not that vegetable gardens aren't pretty anyway, but, you know, there you go. Right, and then the last thing is if even if you don't eat them, they make a great garnish. But don't just go out and grab any old flour to make a garnish on a on a cake or a salad or whatever. Make sure if you do that that it is an actual edible flour because there yeah, are because some flours <laughs> that wouldn't be so good on because you never know if somebody's going to like, oh, it's on my food. I'm going to eat it. Exactly. That's true. Good point. Because if you picked a whole poppy blossom, although you wouldn't because the petals are very papery um you know poppies were made to make heroin and morphine just something to keep in mind (laughs) right yeah 
<laughs> Something to keep in mind. We do not want people saying, hey, they said to put poppies on the flowers. Although poppy seed or is edible. Food. You know, poppy seed is edible. You just don't want to eat a ton of it. And so we should say that poppy, I guess poppy seeds are edible. So poppies are edible. There you go. There you go. But don't eat them. <laughs> you can eat them in food, like, you know, lemon poppy seed bread. You can do that. Oh, yeah. You can eat the seeds. I was talking again about the flowers. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. So. Now, next, are we going to talk about veggies? We're going to talk about vegetables next, even though we've been talking about food and now I'm getting hungry because it is getting to be lunchtime here. It's not lunchtime here. It's only close to 10 o'clock, but I could eat lunch right now. I'm hungry. I've got another quote for you. Okay, cool. So here's the quote. But it's gardening that's needed here, and that isn't learned in a day. Gardening, that's what this place needs. That's by Agatha Christie from her book, A Murder is Announced. Oh, I'd love to know who said that in that book. Which character, you know? Because several of her characters were gardeners. (laughs) Yes. Well, I don't know if this was the murderer, but this one took place right after the war, and the gardeners had all gone to serve in the war and hadn't returned back to gardening. And so there was a woman that was trying to maintain a gardening and a garden without much help. And then, you know, the help that she had didn't know much about it. So that's where that quote came from. Oh, how interesting. I don't know if I've read A Murder is Announced. I need to read it. So we're going to, instead of talking about a, a vegetable today, technically, we're going to talk about an herb. We're going to talk about basil. And basil is Osimum basilicum. And it is a very popular herb to grow as an annual out in the vegetable garden. And there are a ton of basils to grow. Tons and tons, because it is so popular that I would say only lavender would be as popular an herb as basil. And of course, lavender is a perennial, but basil, oh my goodness, basil is one of my very favorite things. Basil says summer to me. I like basil. I love it on pizza, um, chopped up and put into Italian dishes. I love me some basil. I do too. So let's talk about a few of the different varieties. The first one that almost everybody grows is Italian basil. And Italian basil has several different cultivars within the Italian basil family, right? Right. So there's Genovese, which is kind of, in my Mm -hmm. opinion, the traditional one, the one you see for sale at box stores as little plants, which we can also point out that with basil, you can grow it straight from seed. You can grow, you can throw some seed out in the garden or you can buy small plants or you can grow it indoors and then set out the plants. I've done it all three ways. And in fact, I usually buy one plant of basil at the beginning of the season because I want to be able to harvest early or I plant it, or I do my own, sow my own. And then I sow seeds in the garden, too, because as as it gets hot, basil eventually flowers, and when it flowers, it doesn't taste the same as it did before it flowered. Right. And then there's uh, small leaf basils, like boxwood basil, which sometimes you see almost as a little topiary. They're very cute. They are cute. They put them on a stick, and then they look like a little puffball at the top of the stick. I, I have one of those. Do you have one of those? Out of my garden, oh, yeah. how cute. you got to take a picture of that. I will. I don't have one. Um, and then there's lettuce leaf basil, which is really, really big and ruffly, and it's so big that you could put two pieces on a sandwich, like a tomato basil sandwich, and it'll that take up good. the bread. It's, it's very large, and it's good. It is very good. I want to grow that now. I do, too. Again, I've grown it several times. And then there's one of our favorite basils from Proven Winners. It sounds like Proven Winners sponsors our podcast sometimes. Um, But we like a lot of their plants. A basil basil. We trialed it last year. I didn't trial it that last year, but I am trialing it this year. And I saw it last year at a trade show. And they are beautiful plants. Huge. They get huge. I trialed it last year, and it, the size of this basil, because it doesn't want to make flowers very fast, I mean, it, it really holds off on the flowering. It went all summer long, and my garden got, I don't know, four times its size. It looked like a small shrub by the time it was over with. And I'm also trialing it this year if it survives the deluge of rain, which is still going on. 
And then there's Everleaf Emerald Towers. Well, before you get to the next one, and Maisel Basil, okay. the uh, distinction it has also in, in addition to getting very large and being very slow to flower is it's resistant to powdery mildew. mildew. And so if you have problems right. with powdery mildew, which in a season like we're both having with all this rain could be a big problem, Maisel Basil it could be. is very resistant to it. And that's a good thing to know, too. So if you live in a wet climate, a Maisel Basil might be the one for you. And then there's Everleaf Emerald Towers, which I, do, I don't know anything about. Have you grown it? I am growing it this year. It's from Pan American Seed, and they sent me a trial plant. And it was about maybe six inches tall, and it's a foot tall, and it's supposed to get like two to three feet and just straight up. And so far, I really like it. It really looks good. So is it another one that's also not going to do a lot of um, flowering? I mean, is that one of its? I don't know. I know nothing about this one. I think its claim to fame is it grows straight up and is a narrow, tall, narrow plant. And so I am Ooh, pretty excited about it. I think it's going to be a winner. That is exciting. Because if you want to grow the herbs, you know, like a little herb garden and you want different shapes and sizes... Growing these as tall right. pillars, I guess, would be really, really cool. I think it would be interesting. I'd like to try it, too. Maybe I'll do it next year. It comes from Pan American Seed, so we'll be able to get seed for it. If not this year, pretty soon, because they usually if they send out trial plants, you can get the plants or the seed the following year right. in the marketplace, usually, if they do well. I'm going to grow that one again. Cool. So Thai basil, uh, let's talk about some other basils. Um, other basils have a little bit different flavor. They're all in the basil family, and they are all very interesting plants. But Thai basil is really, really good in Thai recipes. It has a little different taste than Italian basil. It's uh, not quite as, I would say, not quite as subtle. I grow it every year because I really like it. It's a very pretty plant with small leaves, and the ones I've had have bloomed purple in the past. And... Uh, I just think it's a really great plant, and on my blog, I have a recipe for Thai basil eggplant, which I'm going to try to find, or maybe I'll just publish it this week again um, as a separate post. I make it every year because, as you know, eggplant is one of my very, very, especially Asian eggplants are one of my very favorite vegetables. I, I'm going to have to trust you on this because I don't think I've grown Thai basil before. I think you would like it, but if you, you know, if you aren't going to make any Thai recipes, you might not want it. You know what I mean? I eat a lot of Thai food. Right. Yeah. Bec Why waste the space? Right. Because I'm gluten-free. I eat a lot of Thai food. And uh, Thai basil is one of my favorite things. Then there's purple basil, which I have never cooked with. But I grow it every year because I think it's pretty. It is a great accent plant with its dark purple leaves. And so I've only grown it as an accent plant. And it has purpley, uh, roughly leaves. And I think the two varieties that are uh, commonplace in the marketplace are purple ruffles, which has a very ruffly leaf, very, very pretty plant. Um, but it does flower pretty quickly, but I'm not going to eat it anyway, so I just keep breaking it off. And then the other one I want to say is red reuben. Does that sound right? I think it is. Yeah, that could be. Um, and it's a good plant, too. Not as decorative as uh, purple ruffles yes it is red reuben i just looked it up okay so very very pretty very nice pretty pretty plants um but i have not eaten them i know you can eat them and also one time i did make a vinegar with them a purple vinegar and it was very pretty by the way speaking of vin vinegars we should mention that um basil and then some of our edible flowers that we talked about before you can use those to flavor a vinegar like a white vinegar you you put it in a bottle with vinegar and let it set. Right. Vinegars are really easy to make. Unlike oils, they don't spoil so easily. Um, I don't even know if they ever spoil. I've never had a vinegar spoil. Um, yeah, and you can make, use those with your olive oil to make really interesting salad dressings, and you can do a lot of other things with them. I know people put use basil vinegar on, um, on fruit salads, for example. Yes. With some oil. And it's very, very good if you add a little sugar to it. And then there's holy basil, which I only started growing a couple of years ago. And it's Osimum tenu, tenuiflorum. Yeah, tenuiflorum. Yes. 
I think holly basil is one of the most beautiful plants I've ever grown. It blooms purple, but it's kind of this iridescent purple, and it gets very big and tall, and it is an absolute pollinator magnet. And I've never grown it, and now I, I have to grow it. In fact, I need to find the plant today. You, you have to grow it. I don't know if I've ever found... No, that's not true. Down in Texas, when I went down there to speak one time, I did find a a holy basil plant, and that's what got me started. And ever since then, I try my best to find one, although they're hard to find in Oklahoma, so I have grown it from seed. It is a little hard to grow from seed, only because the seeds are so tiny. Well, I'll have to check that out. Mm -hmm. We... The interesting thing about basil is there are so many different varieties that, you know, we talk about these national collections... So you could grow your own collection of basil and not be bored. You could. And not be bored ever. And they all taste differently. Yes. So it's really good. And they're grown mostly in the summertime because they love heat. In fact, that's the hardest part this year is that we haven't had any heat. And so our my basils are kind of sitting there shivering. But soon it should get warm. We are in middle of June, right? And my basil also is sitting there thinking... <laughs> Why am I getting all this water all the time? They just don't really like that. Right. So like most herbs that people commonly grow, they're kind of Mediterranean, and so they would rather have some heat and less water. But we can only do what we can do. Um, People, if you're worried about growing them and having them drown, you can grow them as potted plants in containers, and they do really, really well. Yeah, and you can, people do grow basil indoors in the wintertime. Um, They're never going to be as big a plant as you get in the summertime, and you almost have to have supplemental bright lights to grow them under to get much leaf matter to matter. Exactly, and and I've done that a couple of times, and they just don't. They don't do that well unless you grow them under grow lights or something. Um, I've tried growing them out in the greenhouse, but there's just not enough light. Because as you know, when the light goes down... Nothing grows. Right. And we mentioned already the, the main problem that people have with basil is powdery mildew. Um, and by it's, it's sort of if you have the right climate, you might not have that problem. But if you have that problem, then a basil basil is the first one that's really come out that's resistant to powdery mildew. Almost impossible for it to get powdery mildew according to proven winners. Yeah, I didn't see it on my plant, but of course last year wasn't as wet as this year, so this year will be a good test. Um, their basil is really good on pizza. We've said it's good in Thai food. I've also made a pesto with it, and especially when it's about to flower and you need to cut it way back anyway to try to stop it from flowering so fast, that's a good time to make pesto. And personally, I don't really like pine nut pesto, so I make my pesto with walnuts. Oh, that's a good idea. I've made pesto with garlic in it. And that's good, too. It is very good with garlic, but and we should discuss garlic another day because there's a whole bunch of it, too. Woo-hoo. We'll discuss garlic another day. You know what? There's just no end to the stuff that we can talk about that we eat because we like to eat. Exactly. One last thing about basil, and you mentioned like when it's going to flower and you keep pinching off the blooms and get the plant to grow more and more leaves because you really want a lot of leaves on your basil. Right. You don't want blooms. Blooms make it taste differently. So is that enough about basil? Yeah, because now I'm really, really getting hungry. I'm about to starve myself. So should we talk about some dirt? Maybe that'll settle us down. Yeah, let's talk about some dirt. And I came up with this topic because you've been out touring gardens. Yes, I have. Private gardens. I went on a garden tour a couple of weeks ago to private gardens, and we... Maybe it's a good idea we talk about how should one behave when touring a garden. Yes. Because we've, we've seen people misbehave in gardens. So, Carol, tell how people misbehave in gardens. <laughs> well, they, they do things you're like, really? So they, they, they steal seeds. They step. Do you want to hear the top thing, the top thing that I, somebody told me she does? Well, a lady told me one time at a book signing that just made me kind of shiver. What was that? It's the she carries around clippers in her purse and she just takes her own cuttings. That is criminal. <laughs> 
well, you know, Beatrix Potter did it. <laughs> that at least she said she did in her letters well, to her friends. But let's put it this way. If you take cuttings in other people's gardens, don't let anybody see you. And on top of that, don't brag about it. <laughs> exactly. And here's what I would tell people. Two things. Number one, many of the plants that we purchase and buy today have patents on them, which makes it illegal yes. to propagate them without a license. <laughs> yeah. And number two, I tell people, if you steal a plant or a cutting or a seed from another garden, it will not grow. <laughs> it's like... Or oh, it shouldn't in the, grow. In the painted death. <laughs> In the painted desert, when people stole, you know, the the living rocks, the fossils, um, they would tell them that they were going to be cursed. And so people sent them back because their lives went crazy. So oh, for you all, it won't grow. I saw a movie <laughs> like that, Dee. I, I cannot remember the movie, but the little kid <laughs> didn't realize. And he picked up a bunch of rocks and he put them in his pocket. And he had wandered off yeah. from the family in the desert and they found them and then they all went home and then the weirdest things started happening in that house and they finally figured out it was these rocks and they couldn't get fast enough back to the desert to return them i wish i remember the name of the movie but it's like stuff's coming out of the walls it was horrible Okay, for all of you who don't know Carol very well, Carol loves horror movies, which is so out of character for well, her. Well, I don't love but them. But she goes to horror movies a lot. I don't love them. Well, your best friend I loves go them. and, you know, but you find out interesting <laughs> things. So, so suffice it to say, we are anti-theft in a garden when you're touring it. Would that be sufficient to say? Yeah, don't don't bring your own clippers because here's the thing. Almost all gardeners, unless if it's a pass along plant that they actually can share, almost all gardeners will share that plant with you, a cutting or something else. So if you really, really love something, just tell the gardener that you love it and they will probably share it with you. We went to one lady's garden in Denver with the fling, and, oh, her garden was beautiful, Carol. And she had gardened there for 45 years, and it was just lovely. You would have loved it. And she had this little sedum that was just beautiful, and somebody said it, how pretty it was, and before long she had pulled several apart and gave them to a whole bunch of people. That's nice. So gardeners are generous. They're generous people, and they will often give you something. And... Also, try to stay on the paths. Some of these gardens we went to, the paths were really, really narrow because they're in a desert climate and they were packing in as many plants as they could. And they were really sweet and they said, it's okay if you step on the plants because they had some, you know, steppable kind of um, ground cover plants. Right. Like Creeping Thyme was very, very popular in these gardens. And um, they were like, it's okay if you step on them, but do your best to stay on the paths, watch your step follow any signs they put up because sometimes we were on a very, very hilly, hilly garden and the gardener had put a big basket on one of the paths because it was very steep and he didn't want anyone to get hurt. Um, if they blockade it, blocked a section, don't go around the blockade. Right. Yes. Because there might be a reason they don't want you to do that. Like you said, it could be a very steep incline and they're afraid somebody's going to fall or, or whatever. And almost, almost all of these paths were gravel. And so even though most of us wore really good shoes, and that would be my other travel tip, is wear really good shoes that can handle different types of terrain when you're touring because you just never know. Um, also, I've had my garden on tour. Have you ever had your garden on tour? Heavens no. Okay, well, we both know that people who have their gardens on tour work really, really hard to get them ready, you know, as tour ready as they can get right. them. And tour gardens are like pageant girls. And I did a whole post on that one time. That is not how that garden looks on any other day during the year, it, like it is on tour. Everybody's been snipped. All the paths are good. You know, it's good as it can be. So I always try really hard to be kind and thankful and complimentary. And um, the reason I do that is because I know how hard work it is to put it together. Right. And which reminds me, you also, I did not know this, but you said, like, you grow tons of daylilies. Don't touch the daylily flowers because it causes them to wilt. Right. Daylily flowers are almost all water, and, and that's why they glisten in the sunlight. It's called diamond dusting. And if you touch them with your finger, 
um, it will it will wilt them. So I, as a general rule, I don't touch much of anything in someone's garden, but I do pull down a stem to smell a rose, and that that to me is just being complimentary. Right. You know, to smell the rose in someone's garden, but otherwise, I'm really really careful, very careful. Um, what the other thing that you brought up, it's about the Himalayan poppies. Yeah, we had a, a garden here in Indianapolis, Newfields, and they had the Himalayan, wow. the rare blue Himalayan poppies. They got them to bloom, and they had this nice bed, and they were excited, and they posted it on social media. And so I think some people went just to see this rare blue Himalayan poppy. And then some fool stepped in the bed probably take a better picture and stepped on them and ruined them for everybody else. That is very bad behavior. Yeah. Um, don't ever step in the beds cause it compacts the soil. If you don't step on the plant itself. And I bet that person was really sad. They did that I hope they were. because I hope they were embarrassed. Well, Himalay, <laughs> Himalay and blue poppies are super hard to grow. I don't know how somebody got them. They did. They grow. did. And then the other thing is, if you see a weed or you see a flower that needs to be deadheaded, just leave it alone. Don't point it out. They probably thought they got everything, but you can't because the garden is constantly changing and everything might have looked good at midnight last the night before the tour when they finally collapsed and said we can do no more. And then the next morning, of course. Mm-hmm. A daylily tour, which I've been on, was the hardest garden tour I've ever had because you not only have to get all the plants up to snuff and you have to feed them, feed the soil around them to get them to bloom, which, by the way, for daylilies, you feed them with nitrogen like you do grass to get them to bulk up. But the night before, you have to go out and deadhead every single daylily because, as you know, they only bloom once a day. I mean, one day at a time, one day, and that's, all, that's what it means, beauty for a day. Anyway... Um, it's a lot of work, and I deadheaded my garden, which only had 250 daylilies, and then I went over to my friend's garden, and hers had 1,000 daylilies. Woo! And I and, my, yeah, I and my daughter Claire and two other ladies and the owner of the garden, who was just about half dead from trying to get it all mulched and ready, um, we went around and deadheaded that garden in about... Actually, that's called live heading because you did you live head them the night before they're still alive. So we went and did that, and we, it probably took us two hours to all of us together because she had some really big plants. So um, it's a lot of work to put your garden on tour, and I always really appreciate them doing. Them. I always ask before I take pictures, unless of course it's a garden blogger's fling because they know we're there to take pictures. Um, I don't I don't ever mind people taking pictures in my garden. I love that, in fact, and then. But especially of the owners. Some owners don't want to be on social media. Right. And so I always ask them. And then don't go inside their house without them asking. And don't take pictures of the inside of their house without asking. Those are good tips. Because that's not part of the tour. Right. And if they're kind enough, for example, to let you use one of their uh, bathroom facilities, you know, leave it very, very clean. Be a good (laughs) guest. So they'll do it again for the next pretend, group, of, group of gardeners. <laughs> so the thing is, is pretend that your mother's, t- mother's there with you and you're about five years old and she's telling you how to act. But we sound so bossy. I don't mean to sound bossy. We are bossy. Are we bossy? Oh, gosh. We're bossy. <laughs> the anyway. main thing, too, is go, to, go on garden tours because it is a great way to get new ideas for your own garden. Um, And like you said, remember, they all gussied up like it was pageant day, so it's going to be nicer than your garden. And just get ideas. So, you know, leave leave nothing except your footprints on the paths and take as many pictures as you want and ideas. Yeah, and also, you'll if you do ones in your area, if you go to the garden tours in your area, you will see which five plants grow really well in your area. I can almost promise you. You will. Because every garden will have the same five plants. A lot of other plants, too, but there will be five plants which kind of define your area. And I saw that when we were in Denver, and I've seen that every, everywhere else I've ever toured. And it, then you can start, if you're a new gardener, start with those five plants. Yeah, except there was one garden tour. I went on a couple of gardens that were on tour a few years ago around here when the National Hosta Convention was coming to Indianapolis. Yes. And those gardens those gardens had one plant. 
Yeah, it's kind of like a day lily tour. They usually have one plant. Uh, in fact, several people who came on the daylily tour at my house said, well, she doesn't even grow daylilies. Because they couldn't find the 250 amongst all the other plants? Kind of. I mean, they, you could see them easily. But their attitude was they came for just daylilies. My attitude is daylilies are one great plant in amongst a bunch of other great plants. Right. And I'm kind of glad, Dee, that I'm not a one-plant person. I'll grow anything. At this point in my life, I'll grow anything that grows here. There you go. <laughs> Easily. Well, that was great, D. That was great. We're not that bossy. We're kind people. We try to be. <laughs> we just have years of wisdom that we want to pass along to others. Oh, my gosh. Now we sound old. All right. With that note, <laughs> it's been great chatting with all of you over the Garden Gate today, and I want to encourage you to follow us at thegardenangelus at gmail.com where you can send us questions. You can also go to our Facebook page or my individual Facebook page or Carol's. Carol is at May Dreams Garden. I'm at Red Dirt Ramblings. We both have blogs. Gosh, there's so many ways to get a hold of us. You can visit our Instagram page and follow us individually or on the Garden Angelus. And what did I leave out? Twitter. You can go on Twitter also because we are pretty much everywhere. We are. We're like weeds. We are. We're prolific. <laughs> we're prolific like a couple of weeds. So on that note, it was great talking to you, Carol. It was great talking to you, Dee. We'll talk to you later. Bye now. Bye now.